November 2, 2016, 34-year-old Sherry Papini vanished from her home in Redding, California. Her husband, Keith, spoke to her earlier that day, but when he got home from work, he noticed that Sherry was not home and had also not picked up their two children from daycare. Keith then used the Find My iPhone app to track Sherry's phone, and it showed that the phone was on Sunrise Drive, located less than a mile away from their home. Keith went to the location and found her phone on the ground on a trail. Her headphones were also found, and strands of Sherry's hair were tangled into the wires. Keith called police to report his wife missing shortly after this discovery. The Shasta County Sheriff's Office sent search teams to Sunset Drive and Old Oregon Trail, but they were unable to find any trace of Sherry. Due to her phone being found on the ground, many began to speculate that she had been abducted while jogging, while others speculated that the scene might have been staged because her phone appeared to be placed rather than tossed or dropped on the ground. Some people wondered if her husband had harmed her and then staged her abduction. However, Keith cooperated with the investigation and police were able to confirm that he was at work during the time his wife vanished. Three weeks after her disappearance, on November 24, 2016, Sherry was found 146 miles south of Reading on Interstate 5 with a chain around her waist. Around 4.30 that morning, the California Highway Patrol received several 911 calls reporting that a disheveled woman was seen running alongside Interstate 5 in Yolo County. An officer located the woman with a truck driver who had stopped to help her. The woman identified herself as Sherry Papini. She had bindings around both her ankles and one on her arms. She was covered in cuts and bruises, a large amount of her hair had been cut, and she had lost a considerable amount of weight. She had a swollen nose, as well as other bruises and rashes, on many parts of her body, and ligature marks on her wrist and ankles and burns on her left forearm. She was transported to the nearby Woodland Hospital, where she was reunited with her husband. While at the hospital, she explained that she was abducted by two armed and masked Hispanic women, one in her 20s or 30s and the other between 40 and 50, who spoke Spanish most of the time. She said she was held in an undisclosed location and described the older woman as really mean with breath that smelled like sweetened coffee. She said much of her time in captivity was spent chained up in a room with boarded up windows and that the women played loud music and yet none of the things she remembered helped authorities track her alleged abductors. She said that the women physically abused her, and at one point, they held her down to a coffee table and branded her. Police were able to confirm that Sherry did, in fact, have a symbol branded on her body that was not there before she vanished. When asked about the strands of hair found with her phone, she told detectives she purposely pulled it out when her captors took her at gunpoint so that her husband would be able to know where she was taken from. Strangely, Sherry refused to fully cooperate with investigators upon her return. She would often withhold information from investigators or refuse to provide certain details. Meanwhile, many people began to believe that her abduction might be a hoax because many details of her story didn't seem to add up at all and investigators could find no apparent motive for the kidnapping. However, in the early stages of the investigation, police continued to maintain that they had no reason to not believe her. Sherry had told police that two Hispanic women had taken her, but in 2017, investigators discovered that the DNA found on her underwear was from a male. In 2019, investigators requested a familial DNA search for the unknown male, and in March 2020, investigators were notified that a potential relative had been matched. The relative turned out to be the father of one of her ex-boyfriends, James Rays. Three months later, investigators collected a bottle of Honest Honey Green Tea from the trash outside James's apartment. The following day, a law enforcement lab concluded that the DNA obtained from the mouth area of the Honest Honey Green Tea bottle matched the unknown male DNA collected from Sherry's clothing. From this point forward, investigators began to unravel the truth about her disappearance. On August 10, 2020, investigators interviewed James for the first time. 
He told investigators that he did not want to contact them, but had always planned to be forthcoming if they ever did. He told investigators that they had dated 10 years earlier and that they had been communicating through burner phones for almost a year before her disappearance. He stated that she pleaded to him that her husband was abusive and she needed to get away and hide. He drove about 600 miles to pick her up and rearranged a room for her at his apartment in Costa Mesa, California. As for the injuries she was found with, Sherry had asked him to hit her, but he refused. But he did agree to hold a hockey stick for her to run into and to pelt her with hockey pucks. He also branded her on her right shoulder at her request using a wood-burning tool from Hobby Lobby. He said that she also seemed to be purposely trying to lose weight by eating very little and had also cut her own hair. He said they had not been intimate while she stayed with him and that he initially thought that something romantic might happen when she asked him to pick her up, but she did not seem interested. She told him that she was ready to go home shortly before Thanksgiving and that she missed her children and wanted to return to them. He then drove her back towards Reading on the evening before Thanksgiving 2016 and dropped her off on a rural road off Interstate 5 about 150 miles from her home. Just days after speaking with him, investigators confronted Sherry with this evidence, but she continued to maintain that she was abducted by two Hispanic women. Almost six years later, on March 3, 2022, Sherry was arrested and charged with making false statements to a federal agent and mail fraud and arrested at her children's piano practice. She was then released on a $120,000 bail. During a virtual court hearing, Sherry was told she had to surrender her passport in order to participate in a psychiatric program. Upon her arrest, the details behind the hoax were made public. Once her case garnered national attention, rumors began to spread that she had a history of lying about being abused by family members and ex-boyfriends. Sherry was also accused of writing a blog post containing statements of white supremacy against Hispanic people. The post was published to MySpace in 2007 with an author listed as Sherry Graff from Shasta County, California. According to the arrest affidavit, the post read in part, I used to come home in tears because I was getting suspended from school all the time for defending myself against the Latinos. The chief problem was that I was drug-free, white, and proud of my blood and heritage. This really irked a group of Latino girls, which would constantly rag and attack me. Sherry denied that she was the author to this blog post, but it was noted that she had hired an attorney to have the post removed from the web before her disappearance. This blog post could also explain why she said two Hispanic women had abducted her. Many people are angry about all the resources and dollars that were wasted on the kidnapping investigation, but her husband and family continued to support her even after her arrest. On April 13, 2022, Sherry pleaded guilty to her charges and made a statement through her attorney apologizing for what she did and finally admitted that her kidnapping was in fact a hoax. She didn't explain why she lied about being abducted, and her lawyer stated that she probably doesn't even know why she faked the kidnapping. As part of an agreement for pleading guilty, her sentence will be somewhere between 8 and 14 months jail time rather than the maximum 25 years allowed. She is due to be sentenced on July 11, 2022, and will pay more than $300,000 in restitution to federal, state, and local agencies, and her husband has recently filed for divorce. On November 17, 1980, an archaeologist studying a remote area near Ludlow, California, accidentally found a shallow grave containing the remains of a young man and woman. The remains showed signs of being shot and beaten, but neither of the victims had any identification on them. Investigators then began the process of trying to identify the two victims, but were unsuccessful for over four decades. During the investigation, Howard Neal, originally from Mississippi, became a person of interest. Investigators learned that Neal had lived with his wife and daughter in the town of Ludlow around the time the victims were murdered, and they all moved shortly after. 
Not long after leaving in January 1981, Neal quit his job at an oil field in Texas and traveled to Mississippi. Leaving his wife and daughter at Della's Motel in Brookhaven, he went to visit his half-brother Bobby Neal, who lived on a small ranch in Arm, Mississippi, with his 13-year-old daughter Amanda. At the time, Amanda's 12-year-old cousin, Melanie Sue Polk, was visiting and the four of them ended up taking a ride in Bobby's car. During the car ride, one of the girls complained that Neil was playing with her leg, causing Bobby to get mad. The men got out for a walk in a wooded area where Neil attacked Bobby and tied his hands behind his back before shooting him. He then returned to the car where he assaulted Amanda and also attempted to assault Melanie. He then shot them both and continued his physical assault on Amanda. Less than two weeks later, Clifford Brown and his wife stumbled upon Amanda's remains. They quickly went back to town and called the police. Later that day, Melanie's remains were discovered in a different location. At first, Bobby was considered the prime suspect in the case until his own body was found weeks later in another area. Shortly after, Neil was arrested on a shoplifting charge in Stockton, California, and was later charged with possession of illegal weapons. Due to his criminal record, relationship to the victims, the two pairs of handcuffs that were found in his vehicle, and the testimony of his wife, he was eventually charged with Amanda's murder. Neil stood trial in 1982 and was convicted and sentenced to death. Nearly a decade later, Neil's death sentence was commuted to three life terms after he was found to be mentally challenged due to a low IQ equivalent to an eight-year-old. Neil's attorney blocked him from speaking with investigators in California for years about the murders of the unidentified man and woman discovered in Ludlow. But eventually, in 2017, Neil was able to share details about the crime. Unfortunately, he didn't know who the victims were, but claimed he picked up the couple who were hitchhiking on the freeway and took them back to his home. There, he attempted to sexually assault the woman, but the man intervened and there was an intense altercation. He said he shot the man, believing he would kill him first, and then sexually assaulted and killed the female before burying the two in a remote part of the Mojave Desert near Highway 66. Decades later, the remains of the victims were sent to a lab to extract DNA and build a genealogical profile that could be used to identify relatives of the victims. After several failed attempts by different labs, Othram took on the case and used their advanced method to extract DNA from both unidentified victims and build a high-resolution genealogical profile. The agency then worked with Barbara Ray Venter, a genetic genealogist, to use these profiles to establish identities for the victims. In December 2020, the victims were tentatively identified as 20-year-old Pamela Diane Duffy and 19-year-old William Everett Lane. Then in April 2021, it was confirmed through traditional STR testing. Turns out, Pamela's daughter, Chrissy Sally, hired a private investigator in 2018 to research her genealogy and find her biological parents. She had been taken from her mother's custody when she was only two months old and was adopted by her half-uncle. No one seemed to know whatever happened to her mother. All she really knew was that her mother had played the flute in high school and went by her middle name. Chrissy was taken into protective custody by police after her mother's car reportedly broke down in Virginia while with Billy. Pamela later traveled to Mobile, Alabama and waited for Billy to be released from prison after he was caught trying to steal baby formula and diapers for Chrissy. While in Alabama, Pamela informed her mother of her plans to hitchhike across the country with Billy. On June 8, 1980, she formally signed her maternal rights away. Over the next several years, Pamela's family tried to locate her but were unsuccessful. Her daughter always believed that her mother was deceased as she got older, but was shocked to learn how she had died. In December 2020, Chrissy uploaded her DNA to GEDmatch, which quickly matched the woman's unidentified remains, found 40 years earlier, which set off the unraveling of a double mystery. A second DNA test was done to verify the relationship. Chrissy later aided investigators in identifying Billy as well. 
She told detectives she learned her mother was seeing a man known as Digger Lane around the time she vanished. Both were known to relatives as living transient lifestyles with occasional run-ins with the law, though neither were ever officially reported as missing persons. Some family members never even seriously considered until the past few years that either were possibly dead. Authorities found Billy's arrest record and later traced his home address to Jacksonville, Florida and located a number of his relatives. DNA was also collected from his mother, Sandra Blair, which matched the remains of the male victim, resulting in both victims being identified after 42 years. His mother explained in an interview that she and the rest of his family just assumed he was off doing his own thing. He was the oldest of her eight children, and she had him when she was 14 years old in 1960. They later became somewhat estranged once he was 12 when his parents divorced and his father got primary custody, so she assumed that his father or his father's side of the family had reported him as missing at some point. As a single mother struggling financially, her ex-husband's wife ended up adopting seven of the eight children. However, Billy was the only one who refused because he didn't get along with his stepmom. As a child, Billy did well in school and helped raise his seven siblings, but began running away and getting into trouble at the age of 14. The last time Billy's mother saw him, he had visited her in Jacksonville in early 1979 in search of money to help support him and his girlfriend, possibly Pamela Duffy. Billy is survived by his mother, four brothers, a sister, and a half-sister. Pamela is survived by her daughter, two grandchildren, and a half-sister. In addition to learning her mother's fate, Chrissy also learned the man listed as her father on her birth certificate was not a DNA match, putting her back to square one on that search. As of April 2022, Howard Neal remains behind bars without the possibility of parole. On June 3, 1993, a truck driver pulled over on the side of California State Route 152 in the Gilroy area of Santa Clara County to relieve himself. That is when he discovered a female skeletal remains. Not only was her cause of death unable to be determined, but so was her identity. Therefore, she later became known as Blue Pacheco for the blue color of the denim clothing on her body and the nickname of Highway 152, Pacheco Pass Highway. In 2006, Keith Hunter Jesperson, known as the Happy Face Killer, sent a letter to the Santa Clara County District Attorney's Office confessing to sexually assaulting and killing a woman in the area where the Jane Doe was found. He acquired the Happy Face Killer moniker after he wrote a series of anonymous letters to the Multnomah County District Attorney's Office and to the Oregonian where he confessed to committing five murders and used a Happy Face symbol as a signature. Jesperson eventually confessed to killing eight women between 1990 and 1995 in California, Washington, Oregon, Florida, Nebraska, and Wyoming. The Happy Face Killer, not to be confused with the Smiley Face Killer, was a truck driver who claimed to have killed over a hundred people. Eight strangulation murders of women that occurred between 1990 and 1994 have been confirmed. He was called after killing his 41-year-old girlfriend, Julie Ann Winningham, in 1995 and is currently serving four life sentences in Oregon. In July 2007, Jesperson pled guilty to killing the unidentified female and was convicted of first-degree felony homicide. In 2019, cold case detectives partnered with the DNA Doe Project to try to determine the identity of Blue Pacheco, and in 2021, a likely candidate was identified as Patricia Skippel. Don Bethan, a family member of Patricia's, had received a DNA kit to research his family's history as a Christmas present in 2020. He had uploaded his DNA to a public website, but investigators needed it uploaded to GEDmatch, so he did. It was announced April 13, 2022, that the Jane Doe was indeed Patricia Skipple, known as Patsy. Patsy was born May 29, 1948, and raised in Colton, Oregon. In 1993, she was a mother of two living in Colton and was about 45 years old at the time of her death. 
According to her sister, Gloria White, Patsy had apparently left Oregon in the middle of the night after an argument with her husband about a year before her body was found. After leaving home, she was allegedly staying in a homeless shelter, but there are few other details available. Her children and sister were happy to find out some answers, but saddened to know that she was the victim of a serial killer and went so long being unidentified. During the 1980s, a popular trend with radio stations was to give out prizes to their listeners. Unfortunately, on March 6, 1987, a predator would take advantage of this trend and place a call to a woman at work posing as a popular DJ radio host in Fairfax, Virginia, named Don Geronimo. He told her that if she was listening to the radio station, she would be eligible to win $1,000 and a trip to Hawaii. He told her in order to be in the contest and claim the prize, he needed her phone number and home address. The man then called the number and spoke to the woman's 14-year-old daughter and convinced her to come down to the radio station to claim the prize. He then convinced the girl to get into his car promising prizes before taking her to a wooded area along Ridgetop Road near Lee Highway and allegedly assaulting her. He told her he had a gun, and after the attack, he drove away. The teen immediately told the police, and evidence was collected and preserved. Over the years, police continued to investigate the case, and detectives had eliminated over 70 suspects. Forensic evidence was tested numerous times as technology improved, but still no match was ever found. In February 2005, foreign DNA was detected in the sample, but once again, no match was found. Then in April 2021, the evidence was sent to the Marshall University Forensic Science Center, where it was determined the case was viable for genealogy research. On January 3, 2022, genetic genealogy research was able to identify William Clark of Ashburn, Virginia as a strong person of interest. Using this information, police were able to obtain a sample of his DNA to compare to the DNA found at the original crime scene. His DNA was then sent to a lab where it was ultimately determined to be a match. 59-year-old Clark was then arrested on April 18, 2022, 36 years after the attack and charged with rape, abduction with the intent to defile, and attempted forcible sodomy. Police said the call was a ruse and Clark had no connection with the radio station or radio industry. He was 23 years old at the time and living in Herndon, Virginia, and was never on the radar as a suspect. It's unclear if he knew the victim or her mother before that day. Detectives are considering the possibility that Clark may be connected to other sexual assaults in the 1980s. Thankfully, this predator is off the streets and behind bars. On March 7, 1992, skeletal remains were found by workers who were removing a gas line inside a burned-out building at 4246 Olive Street in St. Louis, Missouri. The remains were found under a set of metal school lockers in the old downtown building. It was determined that the remains were that of a 15 to 35-year-old white male, and his cause of death was due to stabbing. It was estimated that he had been killed one to three years prior to being found. Unable to determine his identity, he became known as St. Louis John Doe, 1992. Over the years, detectives received many leads from the public, but none matched dental records and other known details. In 2004, a DNA profile was developed and later uploaded to CODIS. In 2012, the case was entered into the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children database. DNA analysis and profiling had been done by several labs. In 2021, the case was brought to the DNA Doe Project, and a DNA profile was uploaded to GEDmatch and Family Tree DNA. Investigative genetic genealogists began their work in early 2022. They found several second and third cousins and began building a family tree from there. Within a week, they were able to identify that the John Doe was actually Tymon Joseph Emily, who went by TJ and was born January 4, 1972. 
TJ was last seen in Montgomery City when he left home on Rauschenbach Avenue and was supposed to walk to his uncle's home but never arrived. He was reported missing March 25, 1990 at the age of 18. His family had created a headstone with the date he was last seen and the word missing engraved on it. Strangely, he was identified March 25, 2022, 32 years to the day that he was reported missing. His father and brother were relieved to get some answers and put TJ to rest and are now filled with the hope that he will receive justice one day.